Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming to our community event. My name is Beth House, and I work with the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia. Uh, and I'm pleased to be your host this afternoon. So the Alzheimer's Society is delighted to have Community Week events across, I did, okay, across the province from Yarmouth to Sydney. Uh, this is our kickoff event um, and thrilled to be hosting one right here in Dartmouth. And this one is also being live streamed across the province. So we will talk about provincial things as well as just here in HRM. Our community events are about showcasing resources right here in our communities to support people affected by dementia where they live, work, and play. We hope that you'll learn more about living well with dementia, how to enhance a dementia-friendly community, and local resources available to help you. September is World Alzheimer's Month, and today, September 21st, is World Alzheimer's Day. It's a time to help raise awareness of all dementias and call attention to stigma associated with the diagnosis. It's a time to show your support for people living with the diagnosis, their partners in care, and their family and friends. The more resources and support that we have, the better able we are to navigate this journey. Hosting these events is an important part of growing dementia-friendly communities and having conversations about dementia. By the end of this afternoon, our hope is that you will leave with a new connection to add to your support network, that you gather reading materials about dementia and understand a little more about your role in, in creating a dementia-friendly community and decreasing stigma, and that you learn about a program or services, service that's available to support those on the dementia journey. We know that this disease and this journey is not easy for the person living with dementia or their partners in care. I hope that knowing there are others on this journey and that there are others coming together to learn about resources and hear firsthand perspectives lets you all know that you are not alone. I hope everyone here today feels that support. Dementia can be a very isolating disease. Sometimes friends pull away. You may not feel as comfortable going out in the community, doing the things you love to do or need to do in the places that you live, work, and play. Events like this one help bring awareness and understanding of dementia to the community, helping to address the stigma that can often come along with the diagnosis. Simply by being more aware, we as a community can be more dementia friendly, more inclusive and supportive. And we'll learn a few easy ways later on to do that. We have a great lineup of exhibitors that you've already had a chance to have a look at, and they'll be available again at the end of the presentation portion at about four o'clock. Um, and we have, uh, we have a wealth of speaker in, uh, speakers here this afternoon as well. And I wanna thank you all for giving of your time, sharing your knowledge with us. This event is very informal and it's a safe place to ask questions either of the presenters or the exhibitors. So we like to start our events acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq nation. We are all treaty people. The Alzheimer's Society is committed to undertaking work to create collaborative and respectful relationships. Together, our goal is to identify and develop tools that align with the beliefs and needs of Indigenous, African Nova Scotian, Acadian, and all equity deserving communities across our province. So we are almost to the presentation portion, um, but first a few little housekeeping things. The washrooms are out the way you came in. We do, there is also one all gender accessible washroom um, just before you get to the wise room, which is where the exhibitors were. Uh, for anyone who might find this uh, event a little overwhelming, we invite you to step outside into the hall or stand at the back, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Uh, for those of you who may have maybe haven't had a chance yet to visit the exhibitors, um, to ask questions, gather resources to take home with you. They will be set up uh, at uh, four o'clock until about 4.30. And you're welcome to browse them again after the presentations. 
Uh, we have some refreshments at the back of the room. We have some water, some fruit, some trail mix. And I think those chocolate cookies, the cookies with the chocolate on them that I really like, they're at the back of the room. Um, at the end of the afternoon, we, uh, we will be handing out some evaluation forms and we invite you to please fill them in. Uh, we'll also have an online option if you're a techie person and you wouldn't don't want to use the paper. Uh, yes, come on in, come on in. We value your feedback and it'll help us prepare for future events. Um, we will have time for questions after all of the presentations have finished. If you're here in the room, you can ask the questions yourself. We have two staff who will be running around with the microphones. Um, if you're a little shy, you can tell them your question and they will ask it for you. For the folks online, we invite you to use the question and answer feature uh, that Zoom has and uh, ask your questions that way. We hope we have a, we have time to get to all the questions. Um, and for those folks who are here, your faces will not be on uh, the video recording that's being live streamed, uh, but your voices will be. Um, all right, and now I get to introduce the speakers. So it is now my pleasure to start introducing our speakers for the afternoon. Uh, I'll give an introduction of each of them and invite them up as they make their or as they make their way here. I will give them an introduction. Uh, and first, we will hear from Andrew Howe from our very own Alzheimer's Society about our programs and services. So Andrew is our Education and Engagement Coordinator for African Nova Scotian Communities. He started with us in January, January, and it seems like a lot longer. He's been quite. Uh, he has been quite the, the powerhouse uh, connecting communities. Welcome, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to share some information about uh, dementia, about the Alzheimer's Society itself and some of the uh, programs and services that we offer. Uh, so what is dementia? Dementia is not just one disease, but it's an umbrella term for a range of symptoms that are caused by disorders that affect the brain. These symptoms can include memory loss, difficulties in thinking, uh, problem solving, or issues with understanding language. And there are many different types of dementia. So there is Alzheimer's Society, one of the most common, but we also have vascular dementia, Lewy body disease, uh, frontal temporal dementia, and a number of different others as well. And so the disease, most of them are indeed progressive, and we see that the symptoms for them get worse over time. And although there is no cure as of yet, the research is ongoing and the Alzheimer's Society both supports uh, people living with dementia, we all, but we also support research going on in the, um, you know, in the journey to help look for the solutions to Alzheimer's and dementia. So you can see here our mission, and uh, it's important to note that although we are called the Alzheimer's Society, uh, we look to support people living with all types of dementia, and we look to uh, support them in any way that we can. So to look at our clients, some of the folks that we work with. Uh, so our clients are people living with dementia, their family, their friends, their community, and healthcare professionals who are supporting them. An important part of our mission is to promote public awareness about the diseases and their impacts. And so part of the way we do that is uh, through events like this that we're holding today. And one of the important things that we like to make note about is that when we are connecting with community, we're also connecting with all types of Nova Scotians. And so we look at uh, partnering with different organizations, for instance, uh, Health Association of African Canadians. We work with ISANS, um, collaboration with Mi'kmaq communities as well, and a number of uh, Acadian groups also. One of our key resources that we have is the Dementia Helpline. And so the Dementia Helpline is a, pro a province-wide confidential telephone service provided by a team of knowledgeable and caring staff. 
and uh, some of those folks are here with us today. We provide information on topics related to all types of dementia, discuss questions and concerns, and provide connections to services and resources within the community. Um, so some of the questions, just a, a quick sample, some of the questions we discuss on the helpline are things like maintaining brain health, uh, guiding people through how to get a diagnosis of dementia, um, planning for the future if you have, if you have received a diagnosis, um, tips on how to maintain your independence, and also tips and strategies for living well with dementia. So these are all different types of conversations that our team is well-versed in uh, having with you. And one thing that we know from research that's taken place so far is that after receiving a diagnosis of dementia, uh, folks can have a lot of anxiety, they can feel overwhelmed. And so our dementia helpline is there to help support folks uh, work through those feelings and through that, uh, that initial conversation. So some of our programs that we offer, we have programs that are focused for uh, people with dementia. And so we have our Connection Hub, which is a social opportunity to connect with others who are living with dementia. And uh, I believe our first one for, for this season was actually, was it yesterday? Or was it Thursday? It was just a couple of days ago. We just started that one back up. Uh, we have Coffee and Conversation. It's a program to receive a facilitated peer support to discuss their own experiences related to dementia. And we have the early stage forum that we held that we hold uh, annually that takes place in April. And uh, it's an annual event held in the spring for people with early stage dementia to share strategies for living well. And so we, we connect with folks with lived experience to be able to get their perspective on how can we, um, how can we support them. Some of our partner programs, uh, Shaping the Journey. And so that's a program for folks who have been recently diagnosed. Uh, and so that's for the person living with dementia and their care partner. And uh, they go through a program to discuss opportunities to learn more about dementia and connect with others who are going through the same thing. The Artful Afternoon program is in partnership with the uh, Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. And so that's a social interactive program combining art, art making and appreciation in a dementia friendly environment and no prior art experience is necessary for that one. And we have a brand new program that's just started uh, recently. It's called Delight and it's a program that promotes the health and well-being of people living with dementia and their care partners through exercise, healthy eating and sharing strategies to help navigate and live well in dement with dementia. And so that one is currently only offered in HRM, uh, but we'll look to continue to expand that one as well. And then some of our programming for our care partners. Uh, so we have our caregiver education series where we come into the community and we offer a six week um, education program that discusses a number of different um, uh, aspects of the dementia journey. So looking at um, you know, future planning, looking at care for the care partner, looking at how to support your person living with dementia. We talk through those different things. Um, we offer 22 support groups from Cape Breton all the way down to Yarmouth. Uh, 16 of them are in person and six are held virtually. And so these programs are led by an experienced facilitator and, uh, and supported by our ASNS staff. And those are programs that happen in community where folks who are on a caregiving journey are able to come together to, um, you know, share with those who can understand what they're going through as well. And then the You First program, and this workshop is an innovative education program designed to increase care partner confidence and capability and to reduce responsive behaviors. And uh, we offer that program as well. And then for our, our healthcare professionals, uh, we offer our annual conference, which will be coming up in October. And so that uh, October 22nd, and uh, that one is for healthcare providers to learn about the latest in dementia care and research. And then the U First for Healthcare is a six hour program 
uh, designed to help support those living, or so should I say, working in uh, healthcare, working in um, community care, and those types of things to get more dementia education as well. Looking at our first link outreach. And so this connects people living with dementia and their families to information, support services, and education as early as possible throughout the uh, progression of the disease. And so we want to be able to connect with folks as soon as we can so that we're able to support them throughout their journey. And so we uh, build partnerships with health professionals, physicians, and community services to have them be able to um, refer folks to our to our helpline when they receive a diagnosis. And uh, so then we'll be able to reach out to that person to be able to make initial contact. And we find that if, if we make that initial contact, they'll be in contact with us up to 11 months before or earlier, rather than if they were the first to call us. Some of our public education uh, so some of our public education uh, consists of presentations. So again, we come into community to community groups. We'll offer uh, four different presentations. We can talk about, you know, getting a diagnosis. We can talk about brain health. We can talk about understanding dementia. And so we offer those to different community organizations. Um, we offer virtual alts ed. And so those are webinars that we offer with different um, different professionals related to this, uh, to dementia, to education, and they are often, um, they're often related to some of the topics that we're looking at in our different presentations. And those are all uploaded to our YouTube page as well after they're completed. And then we host community events like today and, uh, and, and we attend different displays. So just like our vendors or our exhibitors are in the other room, uh, we also go to a number of community events and do the same thing and, and offer our information to the community. One of our important new initiatives is our dementia-friendly communities. And dementia-friendly communities support, respect, and include people living with dementia and their care partners in the places where they live, work, and play. It's a community that enables contribution, opportunity, and choice. It's your community. So one of the important things is that as we look at um, as we look at the as we look at the importance of how we see in in Nova Scotia, especially, a lot of folks want to be staying in their homes for as long as they can. And so one of the important things that we're looking at is how can we make our communities more dementia friendly so that we can help enable our families to be able to do that. Uh, and so you can see here some of the uh, some of the tips that we can offer. Um, and so we there there are different things that you can do yourself. So introducing yourself with to folks. Um, connecting with people so that you, you're able to understand where they're coming from. But then there's also things that we can, that we can look at different businesses and organizations do as well, uh, reducing uh, confusing signage or having proper signage for people living with dementia so that they'll be able to navigate through, um, you know, rec centers and different businesses, libraries, et cetera. And so finally, as I get the, the, uh, the pull off here, uh, I'm gonna just mention our community champions. I'm gonna ask Roseanne to wave. Where is Roseanne? She's in the back there. If anybody is interested in our community champions program, please speak to Roseanne. She'll have more information for you. Uh, but we want to be able to collaborate with folks in the community so that we're able to, okay. So that we're able to, um, build that relationship and be able to support people in the community through you so that we're able to all learn together. We're all able to support each other together and we're able to bring different resources to our communities. And so we can't do it alone. So we need your support. And so that's why we're so thankful for folks that volunteer with us. We're so thankful for all of our team and for those who come out to our events and, uh, and, we're able to share information with. And so you can see here, 
If you have any questions, please give the uh, helpline a call. You can email us. We have our website and the rest of the team and myself will be here afterwards if you have any questions or if there's any more detail that you want to get on any of our programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So like Andrew said, if you have any questions um, or you're wondering about how to get involved, please come find one of our staff member. We are mostly wearing our name badges. Uh, you can find us at the table that was in the exhibitor room as well. Um, and now it is my pleasure to welcome Cassidy Yakov and Kathleen McDougall. So both Cassidy and Kathleen are certified recreation specialists working as an inclusion and accessibility specialists for Parks and Recreation HRM. In this role, they work with the community recreation coordinators and other professionals within HRM to assist with making programs and services within Parks and Recreation more accessible. Kathleen received her Bachelor of Science in Therapeutic Recreation from Dalhousie University and received her designation as a Certified Therapeutic Recreation Specialist in 2017. Previous to working with HRM, she worked with a variety of populations in healthcare, long-term care, and the community. Cassidy is also a Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certified Professional. In the past, she's worked with the IWK in Mental Health and Addiction at the Guerin Center for Child and Adolescent Mental Health and in inclusive summer programs in the United States and Prince Edward Island. She truly believes that recreation is for everyone and it is her passion to make it accessible for all. Well, welcome. Yes, I will say who I am. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen. Yes, my name is Kathleen. Um, I am an inclusion accessibility specialist with HRM. Ooh, this mic. Um, we're the presentation today. We're going to go over um, what programs HRM offers, some support options in our programs, some accessible features in our facilities and beaches, adapted equipment available to borrow, our senior service plan, and the affordable access program. And I'll let you introduce yourself. Or do you want to? So I'm Cassidy Yochoff, and I'm also a certified therapeutic recreation specialist. And Kathleen and I are both um, inclusion and accessibility specialists. So what that means is we work with um, HRM Recreations programmings to help them be um, more accessible, whether that's through training, whether that's through providing staff, whether that's through assistance with adaptation and programming. So we kind of work with people across the lifespan from you know parent and top programs until seniors programs. So we kind of run the gamut. Yep, <laughs> do a little bit of everything. Awesome, so what we aim for in HRM, we do have an inclusion mandate um, to welcome people of all abilities to our programs. And we work to, together to create a Halifax where everyone has access to meaningful recreation um, and they're able to experience and enable healthy lifestyles, vibrant communities, and the sustainability of our natural and built environments. So this is just a picture of someone in the community using one of our hippo camps, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and then these are some pictures of some programs offered. So we have 22 recreation centers across the municipality. So we span from Sheet Harbor um, to Dartmouth, Bedford, Sackville, Halifax Peninsula, Halifax Mainland out to Timberley. Um, so we have a variety of rec centers. We run a variety of different programs. Um, we've got painting programs, walking programs, Tai Chi, yoga. There's a little bit of everything. I think the next slide also shows some more. We've got pickleball, which is a, a fan favorite these days. Um, then we've got some music programs, photography programs. Um, there's a picture of the Halifax Commons pool. So we do also run programs out of the pools. Um, the ones that are HRM run are the Sackville Sports Stadium, Needham uh, pool. What's the other pool? And then Captain William Spry. Um, and then, so those are some of the programs that we run. We've got a variety of programs through the eight lifespan. And then what support looks like in our program. So, Many of our programs, um, you're able to, actually all of our programs, you're able to bring your own support staff. So if you have a loved one or a friend that you want to, that wants to participate in a painting class, um, you're able to come to our programs 
um, as a support person free of charge, you can participate in the program with them. Um, you can also meet with the staff at the center. So all of our rec centers are run by what we call community recreation coordinators. Um, and they, you're able to talk with them about any modifications. You can also reach out to um, myself or Cassidy. And we also have another colleague, Jen. So if you have any questions about programs, we're able to kind of help you with that. If it's a matter of just being aware of something or if there needs to be an adaptation to the program, we can kind of help you navigate that. Hey, that's you. Um, so HRM obviously runs programming as we as Kathleen just discussed, but we also have um we have facilities and then we also have beaches that have some accessibility features. So all of our new facilities, so any facility that's going to be built in the future by HRM starting now, will all be um follow the accessible building code. So what that means is it will have a higher accessible standard than maybe some of our current uh, recreation uh, facilities that may were old schools that were turned into recreation facilities. So for example, St. Andrew Center is one of our newest recreation facilities and that's just off of Bayers Road kind of in the Fairview area. Um, and it is a one level facility. It has accessible washrooms. It has sliding doors. It has, um, you know, signage that's clear, uncluttered. Um, some of those things we had discussed uh, earlier to help make things a little bit more easy to navigate. Um, a, a lot of our, most of our new facilities will also qualify to be certified as um, Rick Hansen gold level accessible, which just means a little bit of a higher standard of accessibility as well. Um, so if you come into one of our old recreation centers and you say, oh, someone told me that they're all going to be accessible, it's all new builds. And whenever possible, when we're doing renovations, the renovations will be um, accessible. Some of our facilities, for example, the Finley Center in Dartmouth, which is a lovely facility, um, is a heritage property in an old school. So we can do what we can to make it as accessible as possible. There's a platform lift to get in the front door, but it's never going to be able to be fully accessible just because of the nature of the facility. At our beaches in the summer, um, at five beaches in the summer, we currently have Moby chairs and Moby mats. So a Moby mat is a blue mat that gets put down on the sand and it just makes the sand a little bit easier to navigate. It's a brighter color. So you use the color contrast from the sand and it also is easier to walk on. So it's not quite as bumpy um, for folks or to push a wheelchair on as well. And then the Moby chairs, which are chairs that can go right into the water for somebody who maybe isn't able to walk into the water, but wants to get into the water. So those are at um, Chocolate Lake, Rec Chocolate Lake Beach, Penhorn Beach, Albro Beach, um, Birch Cove, and I believe uh, one other in the Halifax area that I'm blanking on now, but it's all listed on our website as well. Um, in addition to that equipment, we also, as a as an organization, so the um, Inclusion and Accessibility Department have some equipment for to borrow. So we have um, our, probably our most popular piece of equipment is a Hippocamp all-terrain chair. So this chair is a really fantastic piece of equipment for somebody, and it's not necessarily just for somebody who uses already uses a, um, a mobility device. It can be for somebody who maybe is a little bit unsteady on their feet or who can't really walk long distances. I know I personally have borrowed it for my mom to be able to go for a walk in Point Pleasant Park, and it was one of the first times she was able to go a really long distance, and it was lovely, and she was able to not be super tired after a few steps. Um, we have smaller sizes and we also have up to the largest size of this equipment as well. And this equipment's really nice because it breaks down. So you can put it in the trunk of a car, um, even a, you know, a smaller sedan, as long as you can get the seat to go back um, or an SUV, you don't need to have a truck or something specialized to be able to um, put it in. So we have that available to borrow. Um, you can borrow it from any of our recreation centers. We would just bring it to that recreation center to have you to pick it up. Um, Oh, and also another story I'd like to tell about the hippocamp was one of our hippocamps did run in the blue nose as well a few years ago with a um a man who had um who was who was ex had was in the later stages of cancer but really wanted to run the 10k. So him and one of his family members used the blue nose and he ran for a small portion and then I then used the hippocamp, sorry, for the remainder. Um the chair up there is a uh, called the grit freedom chair. Um it's a little bit more of a specialized chair. Um, it's still available for anyone to borrow. Again, you don't have to have 
any kind of a disability to be able to try out and borrow our equipment. And how that chair would work is you would use your arms kind of like this kind of fashion. So back and forth, and you would push the chair forward. And so with that front wheel, as you can see right there, it helps you to be able to go over um, kind of bumpier terrain. And as you get better at it, we have one person that borrows it pretty frequently and they go on some pretty wild hikes using that chair. So I personally am not very good at it. No. We've tried it once and I almost went into a lake, but the more you practice, the better you get. Um, so HRM, so this is not necessarily something that Kathleen or myself are doing, but HRM, uh, recreation programming is working on a seniors recreation service plan. Um, and there will be a um, survey that's going to go live to all of HRM at some point in the next year or so, I believe. Um, and right now, there's not necessarily, we did an internal survey and Kathleen and I both made sure to mention, including, you know, folks with dementia and their care partners in the senior service plan. But as a survey does go live, if that's something that um, is a priority to you, I strongly encourage you to keep your eyes on Shape Your City, which is where the surveys for HRM goes and make sure that you fill it out and put the areas that you feel like um, as seniors or as care partners um, is really important for HRM to be planning for in the future. You can also contact seniors at halifax.ca if you have any questions about the senior services plan and our lovely community developer Adam would be happy to answer any questions that you might have as well. But oh, and there's also a phone number to call or text 902-233-8121. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned that as well. We're not able to answer a lot of questions about that, unfortunately, because we're not super involved in that program yet. However, um, Adam would be more than happy to answer questions. And I think it would be important for this community to ensure that their voices are also heard. Um, so finally, all the majority of HRM recreation programming, there is a cost associated. Um, however, we do acknowledge that that cost can be a barrier to a lot of people to be able to access our programs. So there is something called the Affordable Access Program, and within that, there's a recreation access discount. So what that offers is 50 or 100% uh, discount off of programs um, in HRM-operated HRM -operated recreation programs for children, youth, and adults and financial needs. So a lot of um, recreation programs have subsidies are for children. This is for everybody across the age span. So there is, if you Google the affordable access program, there is an application form that will come up. There is an email address you can use to submit. And all we ask is um, a notice of assessment as proof of financial need. However, if you do not have access to your notice of assessment or your notice of assessment does not accurately reflect your financial need, we also accept um, referrals from community clinicians so we've, we've accepted referrals from the community health team in the past or social workers that are working directly with folks. Um, so you can please feel free to reach out to if you have any questions to include. Our, our, in the next slide, we'll have our contact information, um, but you can reach out to us directly and we'd be happy to speak a little more about what you might need if you don't have access to your notice of assessment for this um, recreation access program. I think that's all of it. So this is our contact information as well. Um, we also have an email address that's just a general inclusion at halifax.ca and that will reach all three, Jennifer, Kathleen and myself, um, or you're welcome to reach out to each one of us directly. We all do very similar jobs. And if one of us can't answer your question, we're, we, we talk to each other every day. And so we're happy to pass you along to somebody else. The next slide might say questions, it should say questions at the end. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Cassidy and Kathleen. It's wonderful to know that there are so many supports available to support people. Um, and across the province uh, in recreation departments, they may be speaking to just what's available here in HRM, but a lot of these programs are available across the province. Talk to your recreation department in your community to find out what um, what supports are available to you. Um, when I Googled Hippocamp, because um, I wanted to show a picture, um, you can borrow it from the Annapolis Valley Library in Berwick. 
because that's how you can get it through the uh, Recreation Department of Berwick. Uh, so there's lots of accessible options across the province. So now it is my pleasure. Uh oh, hold on. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Sylvia Colley Ewing, and I have her bio here on my phone. So Sylvia was born and raised in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. She's of African Nova Scotian descent, whom parents were raised in the Black communities of North Preston and East Preston, and she considers herself a Black woman. She received her social work degree from Dalhousie University back in 1992. I may not when she was like six. I may not work solely in a social work role. However, she always will be a social worker at heart. I cur she currently works at Northwood Halifax campus in the role of a clinical support manager for occupational therapy, physiotherapy, as well as project lead for supporting seniors to stay at home, creating caring communities, which she'll speak about today. It's a joint project with Northwood and Hospice Toronto. She's been with Northwood for seven years after being at home for 11 years to raise her four wonderful children. She's enjoyed being a part of the project where we get to, she works with African Nova Scotian communities while building capacity within the communities. It's an opportunity for communities to define their own needs. We're possibly relying less on a health system which may not always be the most responsive to the needs of the community. So welcome, Sylvia. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for that presentation. Um, my presentation is basically here in my notes because it's a, our project is very new. And so I don't have the pleasure of having present slides, but I'll have to work on that. <laughs> So um, just before I start, I would like to um, begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and ancestral ter territory of the Mi'kma'ki people. We acknowledge that people of African descent have been in Nova Scotia for over 400 years, and we honor and offer gratitude to those ancestors of African descent who came before us to this land. So welcome, and it's so nice to see so many people here at this presentation. Um, the project is to me, I guess, still very new. I've only been in this role, I think, since November. And so having a lot of people to talk about the project is so exciting because my groups have been so small. So um, thank you very much for being here. <clears throat> and thank you, Andrew, for the invitation. I do really appreciate it. And I do hope, in, uh, hope that I have an opportunity here just to enlighten a little bit about um, the project that we're doing in, in the two communities, um, our two African Nova Scotia communities. And if there's anything that you're, if, when you leave here today, you're aware of another resource that might be available to your communities or people that live in that community. So as you heard, I've worked for Northwood for seven years. And prior to that, um, I worked for community services with adults um, 65 and under. So for me to be in a role um, like this um, with seniors, is, it was a little daunting to, at, at the beginning, but I took on the task and I you know, didn't know anything about long-term care or the needs of seniors, but I've loved every single minute of being in this role, working for Northwood over the last seven years. Um, and little did I know, actually, I did have experience working with seniors when I worked at the Halifax County Rehab that no longer exists in Coal Harbor. So I did that um, once upon a time when I was in university. So, and I also have family members that have lived with de dementia, so some hands-on experience. So since working in long-term care, I've developed a love for the work that I do and getting to know and love the seniors and working in their homes. When the opportunity arose to be part of this project, I had to think about how I would pivot and accept the fact that I wouldn't be able to be hands-on with the seniors that um, live at Northwood, but to get an opportunity to work with the communities that my parents grew up in, I was very excited to take on that task. Um, and that was my connection to the Black community because at first, it was important to have somebody that actually lived in the black community and I did not grow up in the black community, but my connection was, I think, strong enough. And plus my husband grew up in the black community of East Preston. So it's, and it's great to be able to work with your family communities and find out what they, what they need and get us an opportunity to work with them to stay within the communities or give people more choices to be at home and what that looks like for them. So this joint project between Hospice Toronto and Northwood is the reason why I'm here today. <clears throat> for you, those of you who know Northwood, we are a not-for-profit organization that started back in 1962 as a social movement by seniors and needed to, 
approach to living and aging well in the community. And I would like to say hi to my two coworkers. It's so nice to see a couple of people from Northwood. So good to be here. So we service many clients from independent living, assisted living in nursing home and in-home supports. And some of you may already use these services or know somebody that does use the services such as in-home care, in touch, community, our community rec programs. And lastly, we have loved ones who actually participate in the adult day program as well. So this project came to Nova Scotia after starting in Toronto um, in an area known as St. James Town. The history of the project with Hostel Toronto, that's date back to 2008 as a result of a highly dense community with many different cultures and ethnic groups. It started after a gentleman was found in his apartment many months after he passed away. He was all alone when he arrived to Canada. Lots of language barriers, which limit ability to communicate so nobody ever asked for help or knew how to ask for help. This is how creating care, creating care in communities, the tongue twister came to be. Um, and creating care in communities, it's a transformal way of working with communities. It's a community de development program where Hospital Toronto collaborates with cult in culturally sensitive ways, culturally sensitive ways with local social agencies and their networks of, to identify, engage, and assist those who are ill and their caregivers with the goal of promoting sustained resiliency. Family can care for loved ones or people that they've just met in their community in their homes as long as possible. While well, introducing Hospital Toronto, creating care and communities model in some of Toronto's diverse communities, they learn that while education is not primarily the focus of our work, it's important to consider fully the impact of when engaging in diverse communities with the community development approach. Their commitment to a mutual process of information sharing to learn from one another and to become a hallmark of the program is a key element of success. So people are learning from each other. The overall goal is to have communities driving their needs for health and well-being while engaging with the health services available to them. And as I started to talk about this project, it's very, it's a different approach when you're looking at what your community needs as opposed to organizations coming into your community and telling you that this is what they're here to do. So people are really trying to get used to that concept of like, you're actually asking us what we want and you're gonna try to do it. So, um, you know, continually working through that process, but we are gonna get there. So as part of this, um, we're gonna create a resource toolkit for clients, for caregivers, families and volunteers. This will give them the opportunity to take full, to make fully informed choices while maintaining their independence. So just to show you a little bit about what the, what our project looks like, I hope I know how to do this. Just hit the button. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Hospice Toronto's Creating Caring Communities program is about reaching out to Toronto's diverse communities and building capacity from within those communities. It's about understanding the importance of meeting people where they live, right in their own neighbourhoods, and connecting on a personal level. It's about appreciating culture and individual preferences and learning from one another. Most important, it's about building relationships that inspire trust and improve access to care. We ask the questions, do you know someone who's seriously ill? Are you a caregiver who could use support? And how can we help? Engaging local residents through education and training sessions helps them to become familiar with care settings that can provide alternatives to the hospital emergency department when needing health care. And finally, real success is being connected to people in the community who need support and being invited into their homes to help. I used to live in the St. James Town community. Today, I work with Hospice Toronto, meeting people in this neighborhood, sharing information and encouraging them to support each other when someone is here. Together, we truly are creating caring communities. Thank you. So you see how this work can be and has been transformational in communities. So to bring us back to Northwood, um, the goal from September of last year, like I said, we've been in this, this process since last year, 
until September 25. We've got two years to try to get communities engaged and to the point where they can be um, independent within their own communities. So with the support from Hostess Toronto to scaling up the Creating Caregivers Project here in Nova Scotia, we've actually called it Supporting Seniors to Stay at Home, Creating Care Communities for Nova Scotia. And the communities that were involved in this project are the Preston Township area, which is Lake Loon, Cherry Brook, North Preston and East Preston, and also Guysborough County. So a rural area of um, Upper Big Trackety, Lincolnville and Sunnyville, which is actually awesome because I've I was never in those communities beforehand and I and I know the communities well enough now. So just giving me a little more opportunity to learn the other communities, African Nova Scotia communities outside of my greater community. So Hospice Toronto, we have a li liaison that's been guiding and implementation of the pilot through um, supporting me here in, in, with Northwood. And we elicit support of community partners. So we do have a Kuma on board, the Health Association of African Canadians, also known as Hawk, as well as the Brotherhood Sisterhood. So together, together we'll work to increase the sense of belonging and the connection of those who are living with, you know, in terms of low-income families and otherwise vulnerable seniors living in these communities. And the goal is to have many participants in our project as possible over the next year. And the goal is to support seniors in the community to age well at home by scaling up their current services currently available to them. These services will be culturally competent um, for all involved and support seniors to age well at home while having more choice. And I like the opportunity, I like the option of giving people choices. And um, I'm sure many of you are aware that um, as part of Akuma, that we were also looking at a long-term care facility that will be in the community um, of the Preston Township as well. And, you know, the goal is not to have um, seniors go to the long-term care facility. It's to give them choice to make a decision that works best for them. So I see that I need to pick it up. <laughs> That's okay. That's why I have this because I talk too much. It's all good. Um, so part of this project um, that I really want to stress um, a couple of points here is that it's strongly volunteer based and that's where the capacity within the communities um, comes from. So the goal is to increase the community capacity and having people support each other in their own homes. And um, I know that some of the, the challenges that have been around getting volunteers and that people are already doing the work, but being part of the, the this project, they give them a little more resources. So that would mean that, you know, if they want some more volunteer training, just if they're working with their, their own family member or just a family member or a friend, is that we will support that. So having that real strong volunteer base to increase the opportunities for quality of life and more resource in the community. So our volunteers can provide social support, shopping assistance, accompany to appointments, check in, provide caregiver relief. And it's um a minimum of two hours that we're looking for for people a week. Um, they're going to get 14 hours of training and I actually facilitate that training. And I know people say, well, I already know what to do. Yes, I'm sure that you really do, but it's I think it's important as things change that we educate ourselves as well and the community itself too. So part of the, the uh, modules, the role in the volunteer, understanding, understanding boundaries and cultural competencies, health information. I have Andrew on board to do some um, information around, you know, dementia the impact of illness, family dynamics, and um, communication skills, and knowing what, you know, the needs of frail seniors. So I'm just going to share a little story in terms of, you know, when I said that I do experience with um, seniors, especially living with dementia, is that my grandmother, two of my grandmothers, as well as, well as my mother-in-law, lived in our home, and we provided support to her Um it was very difficult because at the time we didn't have a lot of resources or someone to lean on to volunteer. And sometimes we still, you know, we talk about the stigma that's still associated with whether you're a caregiver, you have somebody living with dementia. So, you know, this program will help demystify some of that stigma and that it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. I know the big thing about communities is, you know, the trust and getting people to come into your communities and talking about what some of your, your issues are. It's okay because we're all in this together. So that building that trust and knowing that there's support out there and taking advantage of that support. So part of the things we're looking for with the volunteers is that they can provide that for our clients because part of this project, we are gonna have clients and having volunteers to help support those clients. We do have two community navigators that are in each one of the communities. Uh, Shandria Downey works in the Preston Township area and we have Stacey Ash who works in the Guysborough County area as navigators. And currently they do, we do have some clients on board and they're the ones that are taking the responsibility for the clients. But 
you know, ultimately be great to give volunteers, even if it's more education um, for the volunteers. And we will do lots of things for the community, providing um, um, some like coffee, meet and greets, some tea chats and our things, um, recreation activities, like something to support seniors that don't like to go outside of their community and want to do things in the community. So that's one of the things is creating hubs within these different places so that our seniors have uh, an opportunity to be engaged and they're not so, so socially isolated. And the big thing about this, it's it's all free. It's a, There's no cost to the service at all. And we are willing to work with anyone in terms of their needs. Um, if they want to be a volunteer, or I'm very flexible in terms of how we offer that. Um, so in summary, supporting seniors to stay at home um, is available to scale up the, the current communities and, and just provide a little more resources in each one of these communities. And like I said, give people a chance to live at home and, and define what that looks like for them and on your own terms. Um, the capacity to build resilience and then make health healthcare decisions that they decide that they want to do. So please feel free to share um, you know, this opportunity with anyone that you know that lives in each one of these communities. I would love to offer this right across HRM, but it's hard when you're a team of three. <laughs> um, but who knows where this will take every, um, where this project will go in the, the years to come. But at this current time, um, focusing on the two African Nova Scotia communities, I think it's it's great. And then I'm happy that Hospice Toronto decide to, you know, take a chance and, and look at these communities. I know in terms of the needs of here is so different than than Toronto and in terms of resources and the challenge that we have. But you know what? I think that we can get through all this together. Thank you very much for your time. And, and I thank you so much for inviting me to this space. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And it's so great. Um, Thank you for sharing how communities can come together to support each other. And, you know, that is all part of being a dementia friendly community, but it's also part of just being community. Um, and we need more of that, I think. Um, so now I get to introduce our final speaker of the afternoon, Peter Fardy. So Peter spent the latter half of his professional career leading advancement and fundraising offices at two Canadian universities, working with individuals, families, foundations, and corporations who have committed over half a billion dollars to address societal and community issues that they care about. He's also served as a director and board chair for many local, regional, and national charitable organizations such as the United Way, the YMCA, Canadian Canoe Association, the Nova Scotia Dragon Boat Association, He's also played an active voluntary role, leadership role with many other community-based arts, culture, and sports organizations. And he's currently the board chair of the Churchill Academy, a school for children with learning disabilities. Peter is here with us today to share his family's experience following his father's dementia diagnosis in 2013. So welcome, Peter. I'm glad you added the last part because otherwise people would wonder what the hell am I doing here? Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to share our family story though. Uh, and I've been sh asked to share this experience about our families dealing with dementia. And I don't think it's because our story is anything particularly unique or, or special or more special or unique than anybody else's. But I think it's perhaps because the person living with dementia in our case responded to his diagnosis in an interesting way that um, uh, seemed to provide some comfort to other people. And uh, that wasn't something we necessarily expected, but it is something that we experienced. He didn't really do anything extraordinary, uh, but because he did what came very naturally to him, he was comfortable telling his own story about dealing with dementia. So you, if you'll indulge me, and I don't think you really have a choice since you're in the room, um, I'll share a little bit of that story with you. So in 2013, my father, Dars Fardy, was diagnosed with dementia. He was 81 years old at the time and by all appearances was in fine health for a man his age. Sure, he was a little unsteady on his feet at times and now and then would forget names or where he left his keys. Pretty run of the mill stuff for many people in their 80s. And believe me, it's also run of the mill for people in their 60s because that happens to me all the time. 
Um, but he did remain, he did benefit at that point and through his whole life uh, by remaining quite active. He would never claim to be, but he did walk everywhere. And I think in retrospect, that really did make a difference to the quality of his life uh, later on. Second, uh, and this is maybe the superpower part, he was always uh, very active intellectually. He continued to work all the time, even after he officially retired, until he just couldn't work anymore. He spent about 40 years in journalism starting by falling into a job at the CBC in St. John's, Newfoundland, after he had been unceremoniously turfed from the Irish Christian brothers. Now, that is a different story. Uh, it's a good one, but it'll have to wait for uh, another day uh, to tell that story. Um, he started out in the newsroom and became the first national news reporter in Newfoundland and eventually ran Network Current Affairs for the CBC in Toronto until he retired in 1991 at the age of 59. He and my mother then moved back to Halifax, and he was appointed the first Freedom of Information Officer for the province. Um, and I suppose, looking back at that, his CBC pension must have been pretty good because he decided and agreed to do that for $150 a day in a stipend um, and did that for 11 years. Uh, he retired again after that and set up a private nonprofit advocacy group called the Nova Scotia Right to Know Coalition. Uh, for which he earned no income at all. So just a sidebar, as one of his heirs, I was troubled by this trend where he just kept uh, doing things for less and less. And uh, I had a feeling that the next step was he was going to pay someone to allow him to work for them. Never got to that point, thankfully. Um, anyway, just never stopped doing this kind of work. And it was born out of natural curiosity. And that was really his main skill set. He was naturally curious. And, and that just uh, never ended. It served him really well. He was uh, always pretty sharp. We might not tell him that to his face, but he was. Uh, he'd read like a demon. Um, two newspapers a day at least, never miss the news. He loved reading biographies, especially about political figures, but he was equally drawn into fiction. The final and related thing that he kept doing, again, really important, was socializing. He loved a good party, uh, and it could be a party of any size, and he was usually, if not always, the life of that party. I mention these things, the physical, intellectual, and social activities, because in our experience, and this is supported by research, they really matter. And we had the good, for good fortune that these three things became came very naturally to dad. He didn't have to start anything new. He didn't have to do anything unfamiliar. He just had to keep doing to the fullest extent possible what he had been doing all his life. In other words, all he had to do was try to keep being himself and all we had to do was encourage him to do those things. And that's really the theme here. We're no experts in my family. We just have our own experience, but trying to keep things feeling normal and treating the person living with dementia for who they really still are is really, really helpful. Not treating them differently just because they have the diagnosis. Even though he had these things going for him, neither he nor we as his family were surprised when the diagnosis did come. The signs that something was going on were becoming increasingly clear. The story that illustrates this best for us is one where he was waiting for a flight in St. John's. He had been visiting friends and family, but he was in St. John's airport. It was about a dozen years ago when a man plunked himself down beside him and struck up a conversation which went on for some time. When that chat was over, dad turned to my mother and asked, who was that? Mom told him it was Bob Cole. And this is, yeah, Bob Cole of Hockey Night in Canada fame. Before he was famous for Hockey Night in Canada, he worked at CBC St. John's. He was the newsreader there. And my father and he worked together for many, many years. But dad didn't recognize him at all. Very unusual. And it was one of a series of odd experiences that prompted us to, uh, and prompted him to visit the family doctor and ultimately secure a referral to a specialist. In our case, Dr. Ken Rockwood, someone who's known very well by the Alzheimer's Society. 
We all remember the day he was diagnosed because he wanted us all to be there. I don't recall uh, any real sense of despair during that conversation or following it. He and mom really just processed the information and more or less resolved to get on with it, whatever it was. Well, it, it turned out to be a few things. Uh, Dad was never much of a hand wringer, so not only did he accept the situation and the likely consequences, he practically embraced them. His natural curiosity drove him to find out as much as he could about dementia and Alzheimer's. He read somewhere that driving increased the risk not only for the person living with dementia, but other drivers, passengers, and of course, pedestrians. We've all heard stories about the challenges some people have had with aging parents or grandparents to get them to give up their car keys when the time comes that they should. And that can be a big struggle, but it wasn't that case with my father. It was his first concrete post-diagnosis decision to not drive and he never drove again, nor did he ever even seem tempted to. And that may be perhaps because he was just as happy to uh, have a new chauffeur, my mother take the wheel, which of course she did whenever they had to go or he wanted to go anywhere. Given his background and natural character, he saw that there was a story to be told from a pretty unique perspective. Um, he knew that some people were embarrassed or seemed embarrassed about having the disease and they did their best to keep it hidden. Well, he wasn't embarrassed by this and he didn't feel that anyone else should necessarily be either. He was mindful that if he was going to share this story, though, that it didn't just involve him. It also involved my mother and the rest of our family. So he asked what we thought about the idea of him writing about his story and writing about this journey as if we would ever stand in the way. Mom's view was, well, you're not ashamed of having arthritis. Why well, would you be ashamed of having Alzheimer's? So that was that. He contacted the Chronicle Herald about it never too shy to do something like that. And I don't, I'm not really sure. They either enthusiastically bought in or they may have just given in and uh, and uh, started publishing these, these columns. I remember the first one. I opened the paper and we didn't know when this was going to happen. I'm just sitting back reading my Saturday paper. And the next thing you know, there's a full, huge spread introducing him and his column. Huge photograph, headlines, the whole thing. And uh, it filled a full page when combined with an accompanying uh, piece by Dr. Rockwood, who kind of wrote a response to some of, of Dad's columns. So there was no turning back then. Superstar status had, uh, had been bestowed upon him, and it ended up being the first of almost 70 columns that he wrote and were published over the following six years. Every We didn't know when they were going to come. We'd just see them in the paper, but every month or two, Every six weeks or so on average, I suppose, there they were. And in these columns, he would chronicle his regular everyday life, but try to connect it somehow to his dementia and how it was, and in some cases was not, making a difference in his life and experiences. As his family, we were all quite keen on this writing project because it gave him such purpose. He was constantly preoccupied with what he would write about next, and always seemed to have at least one column in the can, sometimes more. Perhaps what surprised him and, and us, especially the most, was how much attention these columns attracted. We heard from countless friends, acquaintances, and strangers about how much they appreciated reading them. Wherever he went, people would recognize him. They'd come up to him and he and mom in the street and introduce themselves and say, well, my aunt had it, my uncle had it, my dad has it, my sister has it, and thank him for what he was doing. They could see that it helped people to be able to talk about it. The columns gave them an excuse, or maybe it was some form of permission to do so. It seemed that if folks had an opportunity to open up about it, it was easier to accept the disease. Dad loved these encounters and would often write about them. He'd find something to write about just about anywhere. For those of you who've seen these columns, you know the topics could include going to the gym, trips to the cottage, dancing at parties, visiting the farmer's market, drives with one of his granddaughters, or using a cane, and many other topics. And on that cane, I, this was one of my favorite columns from the early, uh, the early uh, few. It was published in 2014. I'm just going to read an excerpt from it. 
And so it goes, with family encouragement, I've recently been using a cane. I used one some 10 years ago after I had hip replacement surgery, but I haven't needed it in years. I'm told that dementia can at times cause some unsteadiness when walking, so I've taken my cane more often than not every day for some months now. That raises new issues. Dorothea, that's my mother, reminds me to take it with me, but she isn't always there to remind me to take it home. My average is not great. Up to now, I've left the cane in supermarkets, hardware stores, restaurants, you name it. If I've only been to one locale, it's pretty easy to trace. But recently, I'd been in five before I noticed it was missing. It took two days before I found the thing. Dorothea bet I wouldn't find it. She was wrong. Though she was prepared to write off the cane, she agreed to drive me to try another stop. Moments later, I returned to the car triumphantly holding the damn thing over my head. Most recently, I forgot to take it with me. When I was getting off a bus, a passenger alerted me and hurried to the exit to pass it over like it was the Olympic torch. I now have three canes and a shillelagh, but using an alternate one to go pick up the missing one presents its own peculiar problem, walking home with two. With at least one hand occupied by a cane, my capacity for carrying stuff is limited, so I wear a backpack. At times like this, decked out for walking, cane in hand, I look more like Sir Edmund Hillary than Fred Astaire. So I like that one. And there are many others that I like, but it's just an example of slice of life. Five minutes left. Shelby. <laughs> he then went on to comment more seriously about the physiotherapy appointments he attended and learn how to better keep his balance and prevent falls, a common challenge for people living with Alzheimer's or other dementias. These columns, perhaps they were about everyday experiences anyone could relate to, helped people think about their own experiences, perhaps find the normalcy in them. People seem to find comfort in reading about someone else's journey. In a way, it helped destigmatize the disease and bring discussion out of it into the open. I admit I was frankly taken aback a little by all the accolades he and his columns earned, especially since so often he wrote about such mundane topics as what happened last weekend or forgetting to buy carrots at the grocery store. Talk about slow news days. But after he passed away about two and a half years ago, I read all these again in sequence and I think I finally got it. I now better understand why they meant so much to so many. Looking back over that whole period, he never lost any measure of his hallmark sense of humor or the self-deprecating way that he employed it. Jokes about his condition were far from taboo were in fact encouraged, welcomed, and enjoyed. This was a big part of making sure the disease did not change him or define him or any of us um, more than it had to. For example, as I mentioned earlier, he was always a voracious reader. The house was overflowing at times with bookshelves just bursting at the seams. This prompted my mother to quip that now he would only need two books. I'll explain that to people who don't get it. Then sometimes I'd read his newest column and call him up and tell him it was the same one that had been published the month before. There was nothing taboo in our family. He enjoyed this. I'm sure if someone who didn't know my family were to have witnessed this, uh, this kind of abuse, they would have reported us somewhere and we'd been taken in. But the point is, he this is who he was and who we were. And it would have been very unusual or not normal for us to behave as different people. That would have get left, left dad wondering what the hell was going on. He always got a kick out of this carrying on, and it was always, always his nature not to take him, himself too seriously. I'm the last speaker, so I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here. Nobody, nobody waiting behind me. So a short sidebar. For a guy like many of us who uh, was destined to eventually have memory issues, we all will. He didn't do himself any favors when way back in 1981, he first started using a bank ATM. I remember him coming home and said, I put my check in there like it was some big mystery. But like everybody else, he was asked to choose a pin that he would remember. So he chose his three children's ages, my older sister, myself, my younger sister. Now, if you're listening carefully, I didn't say he chose our years of birth, did I? He chose our ages. So instead of relying on remembering numbers that never change, like the years in which we were born, he had to, for four decades later, remember exactly how old we were in 1981. Not surprisingly, as things progressed, there were more and more signs that the disease was progressing. 
While this is troubling on one level, frankly, we decided that most of this stuff didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. For example, it didn't matter that he would ask us if we knew someone that we'd known all our lives or that he would forget some faces and names, although he never did forget ours. It didn't matter that every time I visited, he would ask me if I ever saw the TV show Fraser. He liked how the father's cane in that show was the same as his. And God bless my mother, who I think is tuned in streaming online. Uh, she may have turned it off by now. She's heard enough from me over the years. Um, God bless, how many times did she have to sit through reruns of Frasier? Uh, I'm sure she could, if asked, re recite the script from every single episode. And I thought about this last year when they announced their Fraser reboot. I think she was about to throw her TV out in the yard until she realized she wouldn't be forced to watch it. Uh, with humor and a positive attitude, um, uh, the disease still took uh, its natural course. And I really do think, though, that these things made the journey somewhat more tolerable and even at times enjoyable, certainly more than it otherwise would have been. And every passing year, although his mental and physical condition condition declined and we became more and more concerned about about both uh, his fragility really did become the more pressing of the two concerns uh, he kept writing his his columns despite the physical challenges uh, which served as a window in his deteriorating condition if you followed them you'd notice a change in the quality and coherence of his writing he kept it up as long as he could with an increasing amount of editorial support from mom but by early 2020, his ability to piece together a coherent 500-word five word essay was, was out of reach, and his last published column appeared in March 2020. He wrote two more columns after that, but for whatever reason, they weren't published. After he died, I found them on his laptop. The final one on, I found on his laptop, laptop was about a trip to the family cottage, something he always looked forward to. There's a picture from the last visit to the family cottage in the summer of 2021. He often talked about wanting to see the view from the North Humberland Strait uh, one more time. Now, when he did stop, it wasn't because he suddenly went cold turkey on it. Um, as the disease and symptoms slowly progressed, his ability to write may have been diminishing, but his resolve to keep writing did not. We didn't discourage him from writing, but neither did we encourage it. Whatever he wanted to talk about, spend time on, or make him happy was good enough for us. During the last two years of his life, he, his need for physical supports and almost constant supervision took its toll on both him and those closest to him, and the quality of life, his quality of life was in steady decline. His mood, while still often upbeat, became more volatile and unpredictable. He became emotional and maudlin much more frequently. And we were told all of this was common among those living with dementia. Over his final year, he became more and more concerned about being a burden, especially to my mother. And almost no amount of assurance otherwise would divert him from that preoccupation. It was challenging for family members, some more than others. He experienced many frightening falls, moments of incoherence and ambulance trips to the emergency department. He couldn't visit the washroom unattended or bathe without assistance. There was a health worker in for an hour or two most days to help him with some of this. Between mom, my younger sister who's here, my wife who's also here and is thankfully a nurse and has been an incredible support to both my parents, they made sure that eyes were on him morning, noon, and night. The main floor den became his bedroom and the pull-out couch in the living room became the watchtower for whoever's turn it was to keep eyes on him that evening. Sometimes he'd forget that he was not supposed to get out of bed, do so, and fall or nearly fall on his way to the bathroom that mom had installed just off the den. We became increasingly worried about him, but it was our good fortune. And we know we're lucky in this regard that he never got to the point where he didn't know us. I recently asked my sister what her greatest fear was during this period. And she said that it was just that, that she'd walk into the house one day and dad wouldn't know who she was. He never forgot us and never even forgot his six grandkids names, at least no more than he did before diagnosis which was often. Despite all these challenges, he remained very engaged and engaging right to the end. He also never wanted to reach the point where he didn't know his family and his exit from this world made him fully aware, had him fully aware that he was surrounded by those who loved him. He passed with tremendous grace, but only after a cry, a laugh, a Manhattan and a resounding rendition of Ode to Newfoundland, which we have captured on video for posterity. That was March 2022, almost two years, exactly two years after his final 
published column. The columns he wrote were so important to him and appreciated by others that we decided with his prior blessing to collect them and publish them so they could be shared. The book by the same name, on the screen, it's here, um, was, uh, has just been released by Nimbus, whose editors took the immediate an immediate interest in the project, and they were really great to work with. All the royalties, by the way, from this book, uh, from the sales of this book, go to support the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia. So we're very keen on having it in wide circulation. We learned a lot through this experience and the story of it. Some of it was expected, some of it wasn't. But we know every family's experience is and will be different. We know better than to suggest that many of the specifics of our story will be relevant to other people or other families. So it's really hard to provide advice to others based on our own uh, family experience. But if we had to, I guess here's here are some of the things we, we'd say. It's important to deal with the disease and support the person living with dementia and their families in whatever way is as close to what feels natural or normal as possible. There's no right one right way to do this, but I think the more the person living with dementia feels things are normal, the easier it can be on them and everyone else. For what it's worth, that's what worked best for us, trying to retain as much normalcy as possible, which admittedly was much easier in the beginning than later on, without denying the fact of the disease. But frequent socialization, intellectual curiosity, and humor were key ingredients for dad and us right to the end. That's because they were normal in our family. And finally, and Shelby, it is finally, I insisted on going last so I wouldn't have somebody behind me. Finally, the other thing I think is really important is never to define the person by their disease or the impact it's having on them or how you feel in the moment. We always try to remember who my father was based on everything we knew and had experienced with him over our lives with him. All the images appearing on the screen now represent who he was to us and continued to be to us. Whether he had a hip that needed replacing, a broken shoulder, arthritis, or dementia, the same person with all the same character was in that body and in that mind, however, however much both were failing as time passed. People are not what they end up as. They are a compilation of what and who they were at every stage of their lives. My father would take great joy in knowing that other families take comfort from his writings and can continue to. We were really proud of the way he responded to his diagnosis, and it helped us to continue to see him for who he truly was. And I do hope you will see, if you read the columns or the book, why they were called Living With Dementia instead of dying from it. Thank you very much. Well, that is a hard act to follow. And thank you, Peter, for sharing your your father's inspiring outlook on life and i'm so glad you were able to share some of that with us today um and yeah i'll you you were pretty moving um so now i'm going to invite all of our speakers today to come back up to the table here and i'll turn off the monitor the projector so it's not blinding anybody and while they are doing that come on up folks i'm going to tell you how the question and answers will work um, so we do have two of our lovely staff members, Nicole and Mackenzie, in the audience. They will have microphones. So if you have a question for any of our uh, speakers today, you can ask them uh, to bring you over the mic. If you are not shy, you can use the mic yourself. If you are, you can ask them the question. We also will be taking questions with the Q&A feature from our folks who are watching online, including Peter's mother. She is there. Um, and they and Mackenzie and uh, we won't hear your voice. Uh, Mackenzie and and Nicole will be asking those questions as well. So 
let's see. Do we have any questions from the the audience here today? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I can't say we're going to do that. Okay. Oh, thank you for. <laughs> Any questions from the, the the studio audience? There is a virtual question. Oh, great. Here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So this one um, is for Kathleen and Cassidy. Um, is there a process for requesting new types of adapted equipment that might not currently be available? It is on. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. So if you have, we do have access to some funds every year to kind of re-up, either fix the equipment we currently have or purchase new equipment. So if you have a piece of equipment that you would love to see at HRM Recreation, please email us at inclusion at halifax.ca. Um, and depending on the cost, that's something we may be able to purchase, you know, fairly quickly, or it might take a little while, but um, we are always collecting information because we want to purchase things from that the community is interested in, not that we think people might be interested in. So inclusion at halifax.ca. Thank you so much. All right, do we have any questions from anyone in the room? I think we have a few more online if we wanna take some of those. There are a couple coming in here. So um, one for Peter is, what do you hope that the book will, will accomplish? Uh, well, thanks for that. It's going to mean different things to different people, but I think what our family's hope is, is that uh, it will continue to give uh, people, families who have a member living with dementia, uh, some comfort and a point of reference that allows them to see that they're not alone. Um, it was great when these columns appeared in the paper, but you know they were there and then they were gone. Um, there's a potential now for uh, more and more people to benefit from them um, forever, really. And I think that would give my father great uh, satisfaction to know that the work that he put into this, which again was a very natural thing for him to do, really did help destigmatize the disease to bring the conversation out in the open and um, make the lives of other people who were in his situation and our situation a little bit better than they might otherwise have been. Thank you. There's actually a follow-up here uh, from our virtual audience to that. You mentioned stigma, Peter. Um, what advice would you give to families who are struggling to have those open conversations about dementia? Boy, that's tough because it came so naturally to our family. It's really hard. And I think this is one of the points uh, I was trying to make. Um, we were blessed in a way that it was so easy for us to talk about these things because there really was nothing taboo in, in our family, almost to, to the extreme because of the irreverence and openness and just the way we were brought up. But um, finding, finding a way to, and maybe the book can help with this, for example. Um, I'm not trying to pitch the book so much, but, but you know, maybe introducing the book to family members or introducing other resources to family members, getting people in touch with the Alzheimer's Society uh, to look for guidance on that, um, finding a way to get those conversations um, uh, open and being had among family members one way or the other. I don't think, we all know this, that you know, keeping things bottled up, whatever they are, is rarely the right answer for helping resolve issues or helping people feel better about anything. And we're all guilty of doing that at one time or another, but uh, we've, ju we've just got to encourage open conversation and look, look for help. And sometimes all family members might be wired that way. And sometimes only one of them will be, but that one person should do everything they can, I think, to, to open up the conversation. Thank you so much from the virtual audience. <laughs> ah, our, oh, we do have some questions here at the front from the folks in the room. I was just wondering where we can buy the book or get <laughs> That's an excellent unplanted question. <laughs> We don't know one another, right? <laughs> we haven't met before. 
I feel like Ravine. Um, the book is available anywhere, really, that you can find books. I found it at, online at the Vancouver Public Library the other day. But in all seriousness, uh, Kohl's, Indigo, Amazon. Uh, I saw it in Halifax Shopping Center. I was walking by the other day. It's in all the bookstores or will be easily ordered in by whatever your favorite bookstore is. It's uh, widely available. And if I'd had my wits about me, I would have brought a bunch of them with me today to make them more available. But I did not have my wits about me. And uh, but they're easy to find. Hi, I just wanted to know a little bit more about that delight program, the new one that you have going on. Okay, uh, so you, so you're asking you're asking the newbie. So let let's would see what like, happens here. Would you like me to take it, Andrew, or did you? Uh, Beth, you want to you want to handle that one? Go I, for it. I can. So delight. Um, oh. We didn't write down what it actually stands for. Um, it's Connie. Yeah. Okay. The virtual audience can't hear Connie. So yeah, Connie will come and say it. I wasn't, I wasn't really prepared to speak today, which is why I'm here. And I apologize that I'm not quite tall enough. So, um, Delight stands for Dementia Intervention Lifestyle for Getting Healthy Together. It doesn't matter if you don't remember that. Um, what it is, is it's a beautiful program. So it's twice a week for eight weeks. Um, and it's for a person living with dementia and whoever they'd like to bring with them. And the first part of the program is exercise. And so we do that at the Canada Game Center. Um, we do the whole thing at the Canada Game Center. And the second part of each session is um, education, conversation about whatever it is that the group wants to talk about. So it might be around um, eating well or socializing or whatever you might like to talk about. Um, so we've actually just started it two weeks ago. Um, we're still finding our way, but we are going to be offering it again uh, in January. So if that's of interest, um, sorry, I forget where the question came from now, right there. Uh, do pay attention to our website or give us a call and we would love to talk to you about it and get you registered for it if, if it's what you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Connie. We have, I think we have time for a few more questions. Oh, I see another one in the back there. I would like to know if I have any rights. I'm a twin and my twin has Alzheimer's. She's living in her house alone. Uh, her two children are good to her in certain ways, but certainly have never faced the facts of how bad things are going to get quite quickly or if they are already happening if i she doesn't know me she thinks i'm her best friend and that works a lot better than knowing be, me because she hates Anne. okay so you know i have to i have to live with that but i'm fine with that as long as i'm her best friend so i go drive to chester once a week take her out to, for lunch take her for a drive do all the things that i can possibly do but winter is coming and I am really worried about her. She crosses the road to the store. She'll have uh, $300 in cash to buy a few chocolate bars. And she just throws it on the counter. She's not, you know, you know, everybody is an honest. I don't care what we like to think, but they aren't. And so many things I see every time I go down there. I'm almost sick when I go home because she is, she's my sister, but she's also my other half. She's my twin. Right. Yeah. I just don't know what I'm going to do because I, I try to talk to her children who love her dearly, but her son does not want her husband or his mother ever in a nursing home. Never. Yeah. And the other daughter has a lot of health issues with her fan, her own children. So, you know, things aren't great. But, you know, I I have no problem stepping in because I, I'm, I've got that kind of personality, but I don't think I can do anything. It's, really it yeah it can be it can be difficult um there are it sounds like there's a lot of opportunities there um but i'm going to suggest that you actually give our our helpline a call um 
we'll share the number. Our Nicole is one of our help the line staff. You, uh, so, I did want at one time. Good, good. And they did uh, send me out information and yeah, things and, like that. Yeah, so they can have some conversations with you and ask you some of the some different questions and get a little more into sort of your personal situation and what uh, resources are available to you, your sister, her, um, her children, and and sort of what might be the best options for her. I mean, these kids, no matter what, truly love their mother. Yeah, they do, and yeah. they think they're. But they, yeah, it's just just it's, lose it yeah. when you even talk about it, right? You can't. Yeah, you can't it's have a conversation. Always a complicated situation, and there's no black and white rule book for what the answers might be. And they're all different, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So I do. Oh, there's somebody waving at the back. Hello, my question is for Sylvia, and it's about the uh, new program uh, that originated in Toronto. Um, it sounds like a wonderful program. I, I understand it's really quite new, though. What my question is, how do people sign up for it in the communities? Um, we have a small group within the church that I attend in Cherry Brook, and uh, we're seniors. But we hadn't heard about the program yet. So I'd like to share the information. Most definitely. Thank you very much for asking that question. And we would be happy to come. Our community navigator, Shandria, has been reaching out to communities. I know some of the challenges around summertime where things kind of just quiet. You know, people enjoy the vacations, but we're just really coming back on track now. So we would, I'd be happy to take your information and get either Shandria or myself to connect with you. We'd love to come and talk about the project and uh, sign up like right on the spot. Um, if you're looking at volunteering, just to set some times for you to be able to do that. Uh, I do have flyers to leave here um, as well to give out. So they said share away because um, we really love to be working and getting this information to the communities and really seeing the benefit of it for sure. Yes, so thank you very much for asking. If you want to talk to me after we're done, I'd love to do that as well. Okay, thank you. Oh, I see someone standing. I'm just going to get you to take the microphone from Nicole so we can all hear you. Thanks. This message is for Sylvia. Would you take volunteers from outside the community? We um, initially, when we started this, um, the project, it was to do our best to, um, to build a capacity within the communities and have volunteers come with, with, within the communities. But since that time, it's been really challenging. And I know that I'm sure a lot of, of um, organizations are probably starting to have volunteers. And so I'm very open to that as well, um, to look at volunteers outside of the community too. As Pardon me? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And the only thing we ask is that, you know, have knowledge of the black communities, but in terms of our, you know, building cultural capacity, that just doesn't lie within the community. That's for each and every one of us. So I'm very happy to do that as well. So yes. Thank you for asking that. All right. I think we have time for one more question. There's a comment actually from our virtual audience, if we could. Um, so a big thank you to Peter from Sheila. <laughs> Peter's sister yes. Peter's sister is joining virtually from Toronto and she wanted to thank you for all your hard work on publishing the book and she really enjoyed your amazing presentation today so what's really going on there is every year every year we draw a sibling's name for a Christmas gift and I think Sheila knows that I drew her name, and this is her way of ensuring that I get her a better Christmas gift than I otherwise would. I'm going to venture and say you might be able to get her a signed copy of the Living with Dementia book. All right, so I would like to just on that lovely comment, I would like to thank all of the presenters, and you can head back to your seats. And I'll also offer that if you do have some questions for them, they will be around for a few minutes after the presentation. And I'm going to turn on my, oh, Andrew, do you want to push that button when you go by? 
Okay, so thank you all. Thank, thank you to all of the presenters today for all of that you do in your community and to make our communities even that much better. So we are coming to the end of our time together. We don't have, oh, it's heating up. Okay, we probably should have closed it or something. Um, it's just our helpline slide, so, oh, wonderful. Okay, uh, so we are coming to the end of our time here together this afternoon. There we go. So I hope you have found a new connection or a new support where you live, work, and play. I hope you as community members have learned a nugget or two about how to be a little more dementia friendly. I hope for those of you on the dementia journey that you know you are not alone. Knowing who can support you, who to reach out to, how you can support others, and having knowledge about dementia can have a positive effect on your quality of life after a diagnosis of dementia for everyone involved. If you aren't sure where to begin, please do reach out. You can give our helpline a call at 1-800-611-6345. You can email us. You can find us online. Uh, we'll also be around after the event if you'd like to chat. You can find some of us with our name tags on. So we've learned a little about just a handful of valuable programs and resources available right here in our community. And we've heard some amazing firsthand stories. Please take this information that you've learned today and use it to support you and your partners in care and whoever you're supporting where you live, work, and play. The Alzheimer's Society, along with other organizations and professionals, are here for you. Let us navigate this together. So this afternoon's event on World Alzheimer's Day is just the start of our Community Week events. We have more events coming up across the province. Our regional staff uh, are happy to, happy to be having events all next week. Um, you can register by giving us a call at 1-800-611-6345. You can check out the website uh, or you can talk to the staff here today. So if you'd like to learn a little more about how you can recognize and respond to stigma that accompanies a diagnosis of dementia, we invite you to check out the Flipping Stigma website. The purpose of this online toolkit is to recognize and respond to stigma and discrimination. It has been designed by people with dementia to help others, including people living with dementia, the people who support them, to address the challenges of stigma and discrimination. Another new thing that we're doing, we're excited to share that we have a new advisory committee of people living with dementia. And the goal of this committee is to ensure that the voices of people with lived experience are included in all aspects of our organization. If you live with dementia or know someone who does, who would like to learn more about the committee, please let us know and we can connect you with our manager of advocacy, Roseanne, who is here with us today. So if you are here in the audience and you would like to talk to Roseanne, she's in the stripes at the back and she would be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, so evaluations, we would love it if you would take a moment um, if you're techie and you want to scan the QR code that's on the screen, we'll have some green evaluation forms that we'll hand out in a minute. Um, you can leave them at the welcome desk on your way out, um, and or we'll be or gather them before we leave. Um, and we also have a sign up sheet um, at the our Alzheimer's Society table in the exhibitor room or here at the welcome table. So if you'd like to receive our newsletters or information about upcoming events and programs, um, you can sign up for that. Uh, there's a QR code on that sheet too, if you're techie. Um, and if you're interested in any of our specific programs, such as Delight, um, there's a future interest contact form. You can fill that out or you can just come talk to us and we'll help you figure that out. Um, and we will be in touch. So I'd like to say thank you again to our wonderful presenters. We do have a small token of our appreciation. Um, and I'll let a little bit of the cat out of the bag. It's a, a copy of the book. Um, I really wanted to tell Peter I was giving him a signed copy of his own book, but 
We have some things a little different for Peter, seeing as he has lots of the books. Um, so thank you to the Zoetsman Sportplex for hosting us this afternoon. Thank you to all of you for spending the afternoon with us, whether you were here in person or online. We hope that you made some valuable connections and we hope to see you again soon. So the exhibitors will be here in the room for another little bit if you haven't had a chance to check them out or you have more questions after hearing some of the presentations. So I'd like to thank you again for coming and please drive home safely. Thank you.